Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 27th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what we've learned in the last week about the pricing and production of ANS. Second, why we don't like the Begich Parnell PFD proposal. And third, while it's still on, Alaskans still are flying blind about the BP Hillcorp transaction, and that's not a good thing. And now, let's join Michael. We're starting off with number one. What did we learn about the West Coast oil market this week, Brad? We've actually learned a lot about the West Coast market, uh, U.S. West Coast market, uh, the past week, and and not a lot of it's good. Uh, the U.S. West Coast refinery market, the U.S. West Coast uh, market for crude is critical to Alaska because that's where Alaska's crude uh, goes anymore. Uh, last week, we talked about the problems in uh, we, last Tuesday show was right after what what analysts are and oil people are now calling Black Monday, uh, when WTI went down to minus forty. Last week we were talking about the dislocations in the WTI market, the West Texas Intermediate market, which is really the market that 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 sets the price or controls the price or reflects the price uh, on the U.S. Gulf Coast and in the in the U.S. Mid Continent region. And, and we spent a lot of time talking about the problems in that market and how they were isolated to that market and driven by issues related to that market and distinguished that from Brent, the Brent market, the international market, which is set, uh, uh, mostly set by reference to uh, uh, the, the Brent price, the international Brent price. And last week, I, I, I was creating this... The, I, Moving from the from the perception that that the U.S. West Coast market, uh, as it always had, uh, reflected much more the characteristics of the Brent market than it did uh, the WTI market, right? Uh, and and that we were sort of while while we were having problems on the U.S. West Coast, it was not it was not as dramatic as the problems in the uh, in the WTI market. That's proving not to be not to be entirely accurate. Uh, there are two things going on in the West Coast market uh, that are that are affecting uh, Alaska uh, significantly. One is the price in the U.S. West Coast market seems not only to become to have become detached from Brent, uh, which was uh, which is what its historical attachment is to. Uh, it doesn't seem to be attached to WTI uh, either, and it seems to be sort of floating into its own universe. Uh, just glancing at, um, or at least ANS going into the West Coast market seems to be floating in its un- own universe. Glancing at the at the prices that uh, the state put out yesterday, Department of Revenue puts out daily prices for uh, ANS West Coast, West Texas Intermediate, and Brent. Just glancing at those prices, the prices yesterday they reported yesterday, Brent was 19.99, effectively twenty dollars. West Texas Intermediate was 12.78. Um, effectively thirteen dollars. ANS West Coast was eight ninety seven, um, nine nine dollars, um, and that's that is that discount to WTI. Not only the discount to Brent, that's a ten dollar discount to Brent or eleven dollar discount to Brent, but but a three dollar discount to WTI is is something that you've just never really I've never really seen 
on the U.S. West Coast before. So, so we're, we're having we're having pricing issues, and they're not working to our advantage. Uh, the the West Coast is is sort of become its own little micro market with its own little you know making its own little weather pricing weather that that works to the it works to the ANS disadvantage. Then on the then on the on the market side, historically, I think if you ask you know. 10 analysts out there, nine of them would say one of the advantages of ANS, uh, Alaska North Slope Crude, is that it's got a secure market on the U.S. West Coast. A lot of those refineries uh, were, were, ha- have been configured around ANS uh, in the early days, uh, even, even as recently as, as two or three years ago. Those refi- a lot of those refineries were owned by the same companies, uh, the majors on the North Slope. Right. Uh, Con- ConocoPhillips had refineries. Uh, BP had a, had a couple of refineries down there. Um, and so you had a, you had a, a certain security of, of supply uh, into the West Coast. So you might get concerned about price, but you wouldn't get concerned about market. Then on Friday, uh, Alyeska announced curtailments uh, of 10% in ANS flow. Um, and what that means is that there's not enough market uh, on the U.S. West Coast right now, U.S. West Coast internationally. There's not enough market out there to absorb all of the ANS uh, being produced. And, and that was a surprise because I, I, I historically uh, one would have said that ANS is base loaded into the West Coast markets. If there's going to be curtailments in the West Coast market, if there's going to be ramp downs, it's going to come from other sources of supply, not from ANS. They're going to continue. The refineries are going to continue to take ANS, um, and and to have that ramp down, to have that 10% cut, uh, is is a significant warning sign that that things are not as great for for ANS in terms of market security as as uh, as we thought. So. So you've got a situation in which price is fluctuating. Has, has, the West Coast uh, market uh, pricing market has sort of gone into its own, you know, micro market, and now production is going into its own little, its own little weather system. Those two things, you know, prices going, prices down, productions down, uh, or or markets down. Those two things don't add up to a very good situation. No. Um, can can we get down into the granularity for a second as to why sure. you think the uh, you know why you think the supply side on the west coast or the demand side of the west coast is is dipped because like you said normally they'd take A and S almost over everything else and they'd exclude other other imports but now all of a sudden A and S is getting kicked to the curb can you tell us why? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the Saudi volumes that got ordered uh, ordered by the refineries when Saudi cut price um, in order to increase market share. Um, in in March and April, and I think um, I mean there's there have been stories about twenty some odd tankers, crude oil tankers, you know, sort of going in circles off the U.S. West Coast. There was a there was a video uh, that I that we posted at one point last week of of all these of a Coast Guard plane flying over all these tankers. And you just you know saw tankers out to the horizon, um, and 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 I think part of what's going on is the the ANS or the West Coast refineries ordered in a lot of Saudi crude, a lot of international crude, uh, before the market really cratered as a result of COVID. So they had all this crude coming. Uh, then COVID craters the market, and 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 what I what I my perception was last week is that would be okay. Too bad for the Saudis. Too bad for whoever owned that crude that was going to be you know sort of floating off the U.S. West Coast. ANS would still get in. Um, that's not what's happening. Um, the curtailment of ANS uh, indicates that that ANS is being cut back. Now it's not being cut back. I mean, you can look at the data; you can see that ANS is not being cut at, cut back proportionately to the amount of to the amount of reduction in refinery capacity. So ANS is still getting some preference, but it's not getting base loaded, um, and and it's and it, and it's it's driven by that surplus of supply that's sitting on the West Coast. So you can hope that over time um, uh, that the refineries won't be ordering in, you know, any more flotillas of Saudi crude, that they that, that there's a hell of a lot sitting out there, that over time they'll work off that inventory 
and sort of get the get the the West Coast market back back in a better balance from a supply standpoint, um, and that uh, at the same time, hopefully, uh, the U.S. West Coast starts to open up a little bit more demand for jet fuel, more demand for gasoline, and the demand side comes back up. So you you hope that sort of works through over time. Uh, but right now, it looks like that Saudi crude, um, primarily Saudi crude overhang, is, um, is, is, is backing out, frankly, uh, some of the ANS. We're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. So, Brad, spell it out. What does it mean for us now? I mean, like you said, the, the you know, supply and price – uh, and market forces all working against us. What does it mean for the state uh, as a whole now? Well, it means that uh, even FY uh, 21 or 20, which is the fiscal year we're in now, even the projections we've made about revenues and deficits in FY 21 or FY 20 are going to be sketchy, uh, that we may come out of this fiscal year, which ends uh, June 30 that we may come out of this fiscal year in a deeper deficit than we thought we were going to be in. Um, and it certainly means, depending upon how long this 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 hangover uh, goes on on the West Coast, this, this, this its own weather goes on on the West Coast, we may be seeing FY21 uh, look worse uh, than than we thought it was going to look um, even even last week. So it's it's it none of this is moving in the right direction. All of this is creating additional financial issues um, uh, for Alaska and and significant financial issues. I mean, we're, we're down, if we're down to, to, to nine bucks uh, on the U.S. West Coast, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the average price that we project for FY20, I think, is around $51, $52. I think that's what uh, the spring forecast said. You know, we're already down, even if you assume $14, I think is the last time I did this number, we're already down to like 48 or $47 average uh, price. So uh, FY20 is in trouble, FY21 is in trouble, and, and the state as a whole, uh, we don't have the revenue base that, that we, even the reduced revenue base that we thought we were going to have. Uh, and, and of course, this is all, uh, uh, you know, again, going back to this idea that we have a spending problem, and it's not a revenue problem. Well, now we got a revenue problem on top of our spending problem, so it's the double whammy, really, uh, for the whole situation. And we are continuing along our merry way as if we're all okay. Now we have no savings on top of it. There's really no other pots of money left to grab from unless you count the ERA, and that's about it. And that would essentially be, as we said before, kind of eating the seed corn um, for future, you know, for future revenues. And, uh, and, you know, and that's, this is just leg one of the three legged stool, you know, we've got tourism and the fisheries are also, uh, in the crapper as well. So, I mean, this is, you want to talk about the perfect storm. This is it. Yeah. It's, I, I don't think people have really wrapped their minds around how deep, uh, we had, we talked about this a couple of shows ago. I don't, I don't think people really wrap their minds around how deep the revenue drop is. Um, in, in the spring governor Dunleavy, um, it's still spring. A, a few weeks ago, Governor Governor Dunleavy uh, signed the FY21 budget at 4.6 billion. But revenues, which was about static to, to what it had been the year before, but revenues, uh, FY20 revenues are dropping away. Uh, uh, well, the FY21 budget at 4.6 billion, FY21 revenues even then uh, were uh, down in the two billion dollar range, uh, assuming a POMV 5050 PFD. Um, and so it's I, it, people are people are not understanding how how significant this revenue drop is. And and I guess what I'm what I'm suggesting about focusing on the U.S. West Coast is we're not finished with this revenue drop. If if we have production drop uh, as a result of dislocations on the West Coast, if the if the West Coast is creating its own microclimate around pricing uh, that's resulting in additional price dives. Uh, on the U.S. West Coast, we're not finished with this revenue drop by by a long stretch of the imagination, and that is that is a real problem, a real problem uh, that Alaska faces. Uh, Josh asks in the chat room: the overhang is a temporary factor. No, how long do you think it'll take before markets adjust to the current COVID demand? Well, it's it's a combination of two things. It's a combination. It's 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 mostly driven by demand. So what you want to see is California. Oregon and Washington, the U.S. West Coast open back up 
so that jet fuel and and gasoline uh, comes back in demand and the refineries start picking back up, needing crude to pick back up uh, to supply that market. Uh, actually, the refineries haven't overhanged themselves in, in product. Uh, there was a story about one of the ships that's floating out off the U.S. West Coast is actually filled with gasoline or ab, or ab fuel, one of the two, that, that one of the refineries in Washington State had made had run out of storage uh, uh, to to store and put on a ship and stuck the ship out out in the out in the Pacific Ocean, so so there's an overhang um, of a significant amount uh, not only on the crude side but also to some degree on the product side. That's going to be absorbed slowly if demand doesn't pick back up. It'll be absorbed faster if demand picks back up. But we may be we may be in a situation that takes us into July, August, September. Uh, before we before we get everything, and maybe even longer, before we get demand restored on the West Coast, and absorb and 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 soak up this excess uh, uh, supply that's uh, that's sat out there. Ben Carpenter last week uh, it, it, during a presentation in the course of a House Finance Committee meeting um, uh, made a made a statement that 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 people really didn't understand at the time, including me, uh, about he was anticipating. Um, a production curtailment on the North Slope uh, coming up shortly, and then uh, a deeper production curtail. If things didn't, if things didn't get better, a deeper production curtailment um, in May. Um, and and turns out what he was what he was foreshadowing, um, someone had given him some 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 insight into what was going on at with taps in the tanker market, and what he was foreshadowing was this first curtailment. Uh, that we had last Friday uh, in terms of a ramp, uh, a turndown on 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 taps flow and and thus on ANS production. Um, he said he said at the time that that there's a there may be another bigger uh, uh, turndown coming. So you can't discount that now that he's been proved right on the first one. None of this is really great news. Uh, Josh says the whole situation is tough, but as an economist, I'm seeing a lot of very interesting phenomenon. Yeah, and. Uh, I, I could see that. <laughs> it is it is, a, it is a very interesting phenomenon right now. That's for sure. Um, it, it, it's revealing. It's revealing market characteristics. It's sort of like sort of like low tide, right? Right. You know, low tide reveals all sorts of stuff. Or if you have a drought, it reveals all sorts of stuff that was underneath the water line you didn't really know was there. Um, and 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 so this is really it's like an extreme low tide or like a drought. We're revealing market characteristics in each of these micro markets uh, that we really didn't that we really didn't know were there. Um, and it's gotten exacerbated on the West Coast because of the Saudi influx uh, uh, right ahead of the crash in demand. Uh, but it, and and because of changes over time in the West Coast refinery market that, that made ANS less essential, um, uh, we're finding out. Uh, and, and so it's, there's just stuff showing up here that you really, you, you never knew was there, right. um, but it's showing up as, as we go through this. Well, it's uncharted territory. It's things, you know, like you said, you were expecting the market to react as it's always reacted, the West Coast market, and it's this brand new behavior that basically throws everything off the rails. You can't predict if things change to that point. You just can't predict it. And that makes it very difficult to kind of understand where we're going. Um, which, which I think is probably one of the other things is making people very uncertain. Yep, absolutely. I mean, I, there, there's, you, you can't, you can't predict you, <laughs> and this is a bad thing. You can't predict right now what's going to happen with ANS revenues, with, with state revenues from oil, uh, even to the, even the rest of this year, even, I mean, we've only got two months left, basically a little bit over two months left in this fiscal year. You can't predict how we're going to end up this fiscal year much less have a good, even a decent prediction on where we're headed next year. Because as Josh just, as Josh just uh, indicated uh, or, or, you know, l led into, uh, this overhang may sit there for, for quite a while. And as long as it sits there, uh, we're, not sure, we're not sure what the heck the ANS price is going to be or what the demand for ANS is going to be. And frankly, we're not sure – just like you're not sure it, whether whether gasoline demand is going to come back or jet fuel demand is going to come back 
we're not sure where we get to even when once we work through this overhang we're not sure what right. the supply demand balance looks like well we there. we don't even know what the airline industry looks like i mean that they're a big consumer of all this stuff and there i mean there's questions as to whether some of the bigs will even survive this uh with a continued shutdown and shuttering and even with federal help and bailouts i mean this this is definitely uncharted waters right now definitely uncharted waters uh for what we have going on um <clears throat> let's see uh Alaska Oil has an identity crisis because Juno can't make a set an oil program and stick to it. Juno chases the oil prices for extra cash, says Jim. Um, I think that's part of the problem. I think that's part of the problem with Alaska in the long run. This is a very specific situation, I think. But in the long run, I think that's a good example. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, go ahead. We, we we do have a problem with our oil policy from the standpoint of, you know, whether we we incentivize producers to be here or not, but. This 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 is sort of exists separate and apart from that. Um, let's see. Uh, production will be plus or minus two hundred thousand barrels per day just to keep the pipeline from freezing during twenty twenty one. Demand isn't going to magically appear on Wednesday. It will take months, and that's if COVID doesn't reemerge in the fall, says Harold. Um, which is true as well because we just don't know where things are going from now. Uh, from from right now, and of course, knowing that our modeling or the things that normally happened are not happening is another way that throws the whole thing just very, very off kilter at this point. Uh, this is why I need Chris Story after the after the show every morning. <laughs> That's exactly what's going on. You set this up well. I know I set it up well. We set him up and then we knock him down. That's uh, that's that's how it goes. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions here. So what effect, if any, asked Terry, would it have if all of a sudden everyone gets released from house arrest and decides to travel with the demand shoot up? And what effect would that have in the long term? I mean, in the hypothetical, uh, you know, if everyone was released from house arrest and decided to travel, there would be some effect. But it's still got uh, I mean, it's still got a tail on it. Right. It still takes time for that stuff to ramp up. You got yeah, you got to you got to understand what's driving this is not what happens in Alaska. What's driving this is what happens in California, right? Uh, be, because that's where the demand is: California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and and so we may say, you know, we're done up here. We're everybody, you know, go back to normal. Uh, we'll ride it on out from the rest of this. That's not what California is doing. Um, and so you know, if California doesn't open back up for another six months, then we stay, regardless of what we're doing. We stay uh, in this environment from from an oil standpoint, um, and that's you know. So our so our fate is not our own. Right, it's tied to somebody else. Absolutely. Let's move on to number two, Brad. I mean, we could spend probably the entire show just on number one today and the ramifications of it. But let's move on to number two, which is about the opinion piece that was uh, posted in the ADN here recently uh, with the baggage Parnell team. This this economic uh you know advisory team dream team that the governor put together and they have a plan for alaskans uh you're not a huge fan uh why what's going on i'm not and 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 my opinion on this sort of comes out of out of the the first segment we did about the uncertainty that we face as a state uh, on the revenue side uh former governor parnell and former senator Begich. uh who've been named by Governor Dunleavy to head up uh, some advisory group um, uh, about how we how the uh, how we deal with the Alaska economy. I had an opinion piece in the ADN over the weekend uh, and elsewhere. Uh, the the one in the ADN was titled "Being Bold Now Will Protect Alaska's Economic Future," and basically what they are what they're promoting is re relates to the PFD and relates to payments to individual Alaskans. What they what they have have uh, uh, suggested is moving the PFD, which is typically scheduled for October, uh, moving the PFD forward uh, to a payment uh, now uh, in the spring, um, and then uh, making additional payments, uh, PFD-like payments, um, uh, two or three of those. Uh, they didn't specify the amount, but two or three of those uh, as we go through the rest of the year. And their motivation is the same motivation that that the federal government has in sending out the twelve hundred dollar checks, the five and five hundred to children, uh, is to is to put cash in the hands of citizens um, in order to enable citizens mostly to 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 ride out the current economic situation, um, but also to uh, uh, 
to some degree to spur uh, economic activity by you know giving citizens more cash that they can that they can then spend in the economy and generate economic activity um, in the economy. I'm not so much uh, opposed to moving the 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 fall PFD to the spring, although although I think that has its drawbacks. I mean, the federal government is putting these $1,200 checks out into citizens' hands right now, um, as well as $500 for children. So, so the federal government is injecting uh, some money into the into the economy, both to to help stabilize uh, uh, individual citizens and and provide whatever um, uh, economic uh, activity will will be generated by having that additional money. Um, I, I there's a there's a case to me. For for delaying for for doing the PFD on the regular schedule in October, because it's not clear the federal government's going to put any more money into the economy on, into individuals' hands after this twelve hundred dollars. Um, and when we get to October, Alaska, for the very reasons we were just discussing in terms of where the oil market is and where the tourist tourism market is, when we get to October, Alaskans may very much. Uh, uh, benefit from having that that shot in the arm at that point. We may be coming out of it, um, uh, but still, uh, our economy may not be may not be operating very well. Uh, and having that additional shot, sort of paired with the spring shot coming from the federal government, having that fall shot coming from the state, the the traditional PFD payment point. I think there's a case to be made that that's that's a good thing uh, to have that have that payment out there. Where I really go off track with 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 uh, with Begich and, and Parnell, though, is on these additional payments. Um, and and here's here's the here's what we're down to. We're down to uh, sort of um, a choice between current Alaskans and future Alaskans. Those additional payments would come out of the earnings reserve account. They'd be excess draws out of the earnings reserve account. There's no other place for them to come to come out of. We've drained the SBR, we've drained the CBR, we're down to the earnings reserve account. Those additional payments would come out of the earnings reserve account and would reduce the investment base of the permanent fund uh, by whatever amount, uh, by whatever you know total those additional amounts were. And and reducing the investment base has the impact has an impact on future Alaska generations um, uh, in terms of reducing the earnings. That they're going to get uh, off of the off of the the permanent fund. So we're basically we're basically saying we're, we're gonna we're gonna take some of the seed corn, we're gonna distribute it to the current generation, and the future generation is going to be worse off as a result of that. I I have a problem with that. This generation, the current generation, has drained 17 billion dollars in savings already. Uh, Five billion dollars from the statutory budget reserve, twelve billion dollars from the constitutional budget reserve. That's all gone, and that's that's been to the benefit of this generation. We didn't have to tax ourselves. We continued to have government services at, at the level we had them, um, and and we just rode off the off those savings, um, and and haven't replenished them. So we're not leaving any savings, emergency reserves or rainy day funds. For future generations, in the first place, after after having drained those reserves, and I think you know, for this generation to say, okay, well, we've done that, we've taken the 17 billion dollars, um, and and that's all well and good, but now we're going to take more. Um, I think that's just, I, I think that's overstepping. I mean, there's there's a there's a a line to be a, 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 a balance to be made between future generations and the current generation. The, this current generation hasn't paid much at all. We've paid a little bit in PFD cuts, but hasn't paid much at all for the spending that we've been engaged in. Now, I know we've spent too much, but we've spent it, and, and it's been to the benefit of the current generation, and this current generation hasn't paid much at all uh, for that spending. I think to now pile on top of that additional takes from the future gen from future generations by by <clears throat> making additional draws on the ERA is, is highly problematic. And I and I, and I think it requires – I think you have to sort of in your mind say, do you value future generations more 
or is it fair to, to is it fair to give additional money, take money out of future generations and put it into the current well, generation's pocket? And I understand that argument. We're talking with Brad Keithley, by the way, from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I understand the argument, but also, I mean, I'm I'm liking it back to Mike Shower's uh, argument about the house on fire and your fire extinguishers. You know, you got four fire extinguishers, your house is on fire. You're going to use two of them to put it out, and you're going to hold the other two just in case the house burns down later. But the house is still on fire. So do you use everything at your disposal now and then worry about that in the future? Um, because, again, getting that money into the economy would help forestall an even worse economic catastrophe in the future. What What do you say to that? Well, Michael, we've already done that. I mean, we've taken $17 billion. We've used up $17 billion in fire extinguishers already. Uh, and at some point you say, at some point I say to myself, how how fair is it to just continue to, to drain this stuff down at the expense of future generations? And I, you know, after $17 billion, I think it's time to draw the line. I would say you're not wrong, but I'm also, uh, again, Brad, making the argument that, I mean, if we don't, I mean, first of all, if we don't get something injected into this economy soon, get it either broken open or get some of that liquidity injected in there, the, the downside of this in the out months is going to be even worse than it is right I mean right now. I mean, the longer we wait and the lack of liquidity is going to force more and more businesses to close. I mean, this is going to be a, a tough situation. I, Michael, I, I don't I don't argue with that, but but that's the story we've told ourselves every year since 2013 since we started into these deficits. You know, we need to have the we, we, we're going to continue spending. We need to have, use the money now. Uh, something will make us whole out there in the future. It'll all be good out there in the future. And 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 frankly, my concern is, you know, once we break into the ERA, we're not going to stop till we drain the ERA. I mean, it, there's always going to be some excuse. <coughs> excuse me. There's always going to be some excuse about why it's better to spend now than it is to save for the future. And and I think this generation has just used up its fire extinguishers. I it I, it you know. It, we should have saved them. We should have had them for a real emergency like we're going through now, but we didn't. We blew them all. We 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 hosed them all down. Right. And I think at some point you got to say, you know, the future the future has some value, and future generations have some value, and we can't keep going down this road. And this is where we draw the line. Well, you want to crack into number three, which is the BP Hillcorp deal here quickly. We got about full four minutes here, four and a half minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I'll do it real quickly. Um, so the Hillcorp deal, uh, BP made an announcement yesterday uh, right in advance of their uh, of their first quarter earnings report that the, the Hillcorp deal was going to continue to go forward, um, that uh, uh, they had readjust the, the terms at which Hillcorp was going to pay out uh, the, the purchase price to BP, essentially put more of it at risk. Um, depending upon how the ANS played out, uh, and that they were going to continue down down this track, um, and I think that's that's fine, that's great. I mean, but Alaskans still don't know about this deal. The thing that the thing that's always bothered me about the Hillcorp deal is Hillcorp is so private uh, that that we don't really know what we're getting. Uh, Alaskans don't really know what we're getting out of this deal. The BP Arco deal, which was the last big deal that that affected Prudhoe back at back in the early 2000s, late 1900s and early 2000s, uh, the BP Arco deal was very transparent. Uh, Governor uh, uh, Knowles held hearings on it, public hearings on it. There was a there was uh, an agreement between the state and Arco that was then, you know, uh, uh, made transparent. Uh, a lot of discussion about it public uh, discussion about it, public hearings about it, um, and then it was finalized, and we sort of knew what we were getting. With the Hillcorp deal, we don't really know what we're getting. I mean, we know what Hillcorp's reputation is. We think we know what Hillcorp might do with the ANS, but we've not, we don't have a good feel for Hillcorp's financials. We have no feel for Hillcorp's financials, frankly. We don't know what their capability is. We don't know what the, what the oil price situation has done to them, their ability to fund, invest in uh, ongoing production. Um, and and we don't really know we don't really know where that's headed. So, yeah, it's great that the transaction's going forward, but we don't know what we're getting out of this transaction. I think we ought to do what we did with the BP Arco deal. I think there ought to be a lot of transparency. We ought to know how Hillcorp is financing this. We ought to have an understanding of what Hillcorp's commitments are going forward. 
we ought to understand we ought to have a, an agreement between the state and Hillcorp, just like we had the charter between BP and ultimately ConocoPhillips in the state back in 2000. We ought to have a charter with uh, with Hillcorp that sets terms, expectations of what's going forward. One of the big problems that 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 I had out of this most recent announcement was a, was a statement by Janet Weiss, who's the head of BP uh, Alaska, saying, "Yeah, we could dis disconnect. I mean, there's there's been issues with the." approval of the transfer of BP's interest in TAPS to Hillcorp. The RCA uh, is considering that. And and Janet said, well, we could just disconnect those two, go ahead and transfer the upstream and hold the, and, 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 and do the downstream transfer and the downstream approvals later. No, I mean, the, Prudhoe and, and the pipeline are an integrated whole. It's very important that we have those two connected, that the ownership of those two be connected. That, that, that the pipeline not be operating as some sort of separate entity uh, disconnected from the economics of what's going on up north. And, and to think now we're going to transfer the, the field without transferring the pipeline at the same time and without knowing what the conditions are of, of, of the pipeline transfer at the time we transfer the field, I think it's just a recipe for disaster. We need to go back to, to, the, to the BP ARCO paradigm BP Arco Conoco Phillips paradigm that we had in, in 2000. Get some transparency mm -hmm. about this. Know what we're doing. Explain it to Alaskans. Not only because Alaskans should know, but because the discipline of having to explain it to Alaskans will impose things on that on that transaction, commitments on that transaction that otherwise might not occur. Um, and and I think it's great the deal's going forward, but I don't think I don't think the state ought to be approving the deal. Uh, under the under the circumstances that we that we that we have to this point, and certainly shouldn't be disconnecting the approval of the upstream from the from the well, midstream. And you're one of the few people that I think that I've heard talk about this. I mean, what do you think the possibility of that actually happening is? Because I, I think that most people are like, "Yep, let it go, let's just get it done." And I don't I don't know if there's any real appetite to do what you're talking about. Well, I've sent I've sent a letter off to the governor. I you know I I, I really think this is a this is a very difficult situation. Alaskans should be talking about it just like we did about BP Arco. Yeah. All right. Well, Brad, um, thanks so much for giving us your thoughts today. We appreciate it. As always, it's entertaining and educational. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3. <laughs>